Good morning. I love that prayer that you would speak for we are listening. That's right out of the life of Samuel. It's amazing. I mean, if you know that story, Samuel's this little boy, and he's, he's living in the, the tabernacle with Eli, the old priest, and he hears this voice calling his name, right? And he's thinking, it's Eli. I mean, who, who else could it possibly be? So he goes, and he's like, all right, so you called me. And he's like, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And then it happens again, and then it happens again, and Eli finally figures out, oh, wait a minute, maybe this is the Lord. He says, the next time that God speaks, say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. There it is. That's it. I mean, that's how we come to the Word of God. You know, we're not to come to it as critics. You know, like, like the creatures are going to critique the Word of the Creator. The, the servants are going to critique the Word of the Master, right? The children are going to critique the Word of the Father. All right, let's be honest. That happens all the time. But, but it shouldn't happen. Not with us and not with the Lord. So, Lord, speak. For you are good. You are altogether wise. You are loving. You are gracious. You pour yourself out for us. We can trust your heart. And we want to know what you have to say. Fantastic. All right, so last week as we continued our study of the life of Jesus out of the Gospel of Mark, we looked at this story at the end of Mark chapter 4 in which Jesus and his disciples are on the western side of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus wants to get over to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee and lo and behold, there's their boat. I mean, these guys have a boat. These guys were professional fishermen. They probably docked it at the same location. Jesus is like, guys, I got to get away from this crowd which is exhausting me and I need to get over there. Let's get in the boat. I need you all to take me across the sea. So they get in the boat. They push off from the shore. Jesus, who's wiped out, goes up in the front of the boat, and he falls dead asleep, and these guys are rowing. And here comes a storm, which is not unusual on the Sea of Galilee. It happens pretty frequently. The Sea of Galilee is located in a gash in the earth. It's deep. It's low. And it's surrounded by mountains. And so when the wind comes in from the north, it's like it gets forced through a tunnel. And the sea gets rough, and the professionals get nervous. Like we talked about that last week. That's when you should get nervous. It's like when those guys are nervous, now I'm nervous, and they're freaking out. And they're irritated with Jesus because he's asleep, and they wake him up. They're like, well, how can you even sleep right now? I mean, this is crazy. Get up. Do you not care that we're perishing? And what does Jesus do? Does he speak to the disciples? Yeah, eventually. Does he cry out, oh, dear God, would you please calm the storm? No. He speaks to the storm, to the wind, to the waves. And then they obey him. It goes from we might die to we, if, you know, it wasn't the first century and if we had a boat with an engine and some skis and a rope, like we could slalom. Like this is beautiful out here. This is like it's glass. This is what every water skier dreams of. This is the moment to get out there and to give it a shot, right? Like it goes from crazy to nothing, and it goes from crazy to nothing instantaneously. And you're like, no, 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 that's crazy, Tom. That sounds ridiculous, and it does, unless Jesus is God. So from the beginning of our study of the life of Jesus in Mark's gospel, we've been saying, look, he spends the first full half of his gospel saying what? Because it's the same thing. Jesus is God. Oh, did you get that? Okay, all right, let me give it to you again. Jesus is God. How about now? Any buy-in? No still doubters? Jesus is God. Okay, Jesus is God. He's God. He's God. He's God. It's like the drum that he beats all the way through the first half of his gospel. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a great prophet. He's not just a great miracle worker. Guys, it's not nearly enough. He is God. And you're like, okay, but that's what Mark says that he is. That's what the New Testament says that he is. Why should I believe what the New Testament has to say about Jesus? You should believe it for lots of reasons, one of them being that most of the guys who either wrote the New Testament, these accounts of the life of Jesus that we have, or were the sources behind the accounts of the life of Jesus that we have, were in the boat, for example, with him in the storm, when he then stood up, probably like this, and spoke to the wind and the waves, and it went silent, as well as every other story in his life, including death, including burial, and yes, including third-day resurrection. And as we said last week, look, if Jesus is God, you would expect all that stuff to happen. Like, if you gave me the New Testament and you said, you know, Jesus is God, here's all the stories about his life, and there was nothing supernatural, I'd be like, no, he's not. I'm looking for that stuff. That must be in there. And it's in there again and again and again and again. Do you know how the lives of these guys ended? 
hey, Peter, so here's the deal. You were in the boat, you know, and you were, you were witnessing all this stuff. You can recant all these stories, or we can crucify you upside down. Your choice. What do you want to do? He's like, do you want me to lay this way on the cross? Do you want me to lay this way on the cross? Like, how do you want me to lay down on this cross so you can crucify me upside down? Because as unpleasant as that must be, I can't unsee what I've seen. And I've seen a man defeat death and do all of these miraculous things. And a promise to defeat death for me. So you can take my life, but he'll give it back to me in the end. Hey, Thomas, you can recant all of these things or we're going to thrust you through with spears. He's like, all right, well, do you want to make a game of it? Like, do you want, to, you want me to be a moving target? And you guys can, do you want to just do it right now? Like, how do, you, how do you want to do this? Hey, James, you can recant or we'll throw you off the pillar of the temple, like the corner. Like, it's a long drop down and it's stone when you get there. There's not one of those bags, you know, that like stuntmen jump off of the building and land on and they, they live and it's all good. He's like, you want to push me? You want me to jump? How do you want to do this? They pushed him. He landed, didn't die, then they stoned him. Work your way through the lives of these guys. Because if you're going to deny their account of what happened in story after story after story, including life, suffering, death, burial, and resurrection on the dead, or from the dead on the third day as Jesus claimed that he would, and if he is the author of life, you would expect that. If, if you're going to deny their accounts of these stories, then you have to at the same time believe that all of these people universally, like they pinky promised, I guess, without exception, suffered the loss of family, reputation, money, business, comfort, safety, and died torturous deaths defending this stuff. Guys, they wrote these accounts to us in their blood. It's like they, they took their quill and they dipped it into one of their wounds and they just wrote, Jesus is God I think it's easier to believe that he is Jesus stilled the storm he stilled the storm because he's God and the question that we're going to deal with today is yes we're going to see again that he's God like undeniably Mark is going come on he's God oh, oh did you miss that okay okay here come on he's God but the question that I want to ask in addition to that is, all right, well, how should we approach God? Because if Jesus is God, then how should we approach God? And Mark answers that by giving us two sets of characters. So he gives us this character named Jairus, and then in addition to Jairus, this woman who comes to Jesus for healing. And you'll know it when we find her. You see her, and then he gives us the crowd full of people who are bustling around Jesus and, and, and you know, hemming Jesus in and pressing in on Jesus and insisting from Jesus and demanding from Jesus. And he's like, look at the physical postures of these people. Watch what Jairus and the woman do physically because it reveals the posture of their heart. And watch these guys. And know that these guys get it right. Keep your eye on Jairus. So it says in Mark 5, beginning in verse 21, it says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat back over to the western side. So he's on the western side. He says, get in the boat. They get in the boat. He falls asleep. The big storm. He speaks to the storm. The storm stops. Why? Because Jesus is God. They get to the other side. He does some ministry there. He's like, time to go back. And they go back to the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they get there, a great crowd, the idea being who had been waiting for Jesus ever since he left, were there waiting for him. Because they knew where the dock was. They knew where these guys were going to bring the boat in. Like, they knew that he left. They knew eventually he'd be back. They're like camping out. It's like when you were in college, you know, and some amazing musician or whatever came to town. You know, all these people like camped out waiting for the tickets. Did you ever do that? How many of you did that? Raise your hand if you did that. You guys are nuts. Why did you do that? That's crazy. All right, Tallahassee, 1984, Bruce Springsteen in the E Street Band, born in the USA Tour. Honestly, the single greatest concert. I have chills right now that I ever saw in my life. I did not sleep out, but I did meet a girl three days before, and she had an extra ticket. And so I went with her, and it was amazing. I understand why they call him the boss. Like, he is the single greatest live performer I have ever seen in my life. Like, he stopped the concert. It was at Christmas. And it, like, everybody instinctively knew what to do. He just pointed like this in the Leon County Civic Center, had him bring all the lights up, and he just did like this all the way around, like all the way around, right? And we just all instinctively did the wave all the way around the stadium, around and around. It was phenomenal. 
That's Bruce Springsteen. Jesus is God. These guys are camping out. They're waiting for Jesus. And as soon as he arrives, man, they gather about him, this crowd. And and then he's kind of like stuck there, you know, sort of like hemmed in beside the sea, if you will. And you're like, okay, but why is the crowd waiting for Jesus? I mean, give me some specifics. Give me some particulars. Like, what is it exactly that they're hoping Jesus is going to do? And I, I guess it depends on who you ask, you know. I mean, I'm sure there were people in the crowd who were hungry, you know. And they had brought with them a sandwich. And they knew that Jesus could miraculously multiply food. And so their plan was present Jesus with the sandwich and ask him to turn it into a supermarket and feed their family for a year. Some were sick. They needed healing or their sister or their cousin or their brother or their child or their spouse or whatever, you know, like bring him to Jesus. See if that'll heal him. Some needed wisdom and direction and he was at the very least a wise man. I think we can agree on that. Tell me what to do. Some, I think, were straight up bored. There's no entertainment in these towns. You don't have cell phones and Netflix and, you know, like there's nothing to do, man. They don't have electricity. You want to go see Jesus? I hear he's cool. What are you doing today? I'll go. They go. But the point is that they come for selfish, self-centered reasons. They come hoping to get Jesus to bow down to them. But Jesus is God. They don't come bowing to him. They're standing, they're bustling, they're pressing, they're insisting, they're demanding. And then in contrast to that, Mark says in verse 22, then then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, who by definition as one of the rulers of the synagogue was wealthy, he was a man of great status, he was highly educated. This guy had all kinds of political and religious and social connections, like I mean, he had it going on. He was a pretty amazing guy. He was also part of the religious establishment of the Jewish people who, in this point in the narrative, stood vehemently opposed to Jesus and who ultimately would stand violently opposed to Jesus. Like, they did not like the fact that Jesus was undressing them publicly in front of all their fans, in front of all their people, in front of all their followers, how he's showing the foolishness of the rules that they've built around the law of God and the word of God and how they're undoing it. Their duplicity, their arrogance... They're in authenticity. Like again and again and again and again, Jesus is in. People are now beginning to follow Jesus, and they're getting a little bit more than irritated by this. This guy's a part of that group. Keep that in mind, because notice what he does. It says, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, Jairus fell at his feet, the point being publicly. Remember, big crowd, hard to move. Here's what he doesn't do. Like, he doesn't come and he doesn't call one of his messengers in and say, okay, so here's the deal. I'm trying to gain a private audience with Jesus because what I want to do is I'd like to have Jesus come in the house and then we're going to come in the room. I'm going to send everybody out. We're going to draw all of the shades and then privately, I'm going to kneel at the feet of Jesus. That's not the way that it works. Why? Jesus is God. How does it work for you? Like, I'm playing with that idea yesterday, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking, what about private Christians? Is there a private Christian? Can you find a private Christian in the Bible? Search carefully. It's not there. You're like, all right, so do private Christians exist? I think think Christians that are not nearly enamored enough with Jesus yet, I guess, exist. Christians who haven't yet realized that you can't be a private Christian I suppose exist. Christians who, who, who have forgotten the reality that we're called to be witnesses to Jesus in our families and, and in our world and, and everywhere we go. And it, it, I guess you can be, Christians can, but you can't remain private forever. That's not being a Christian. I don't say that to make you feel guilty. I say that to call you to something great, something meaningful, something purposeful, something joyful. Christians who are so in love with Christ just talk about Christ. That's the way that it works with anything you're in love with. You know, like you you go on a diet, you've lost all of this weight. You're like the greatest evangelist for the diet that ever lived. You join a new gym, you're just jazzed, you know, and like you're telling everybody about the gym, you know. Somebody said to Winston Churchill, have I told you about my grandchildren? And he said, no, and I'm grateful. 
right? Like, because you can't shut up. You love them. If we don't talk about Jesus, it's a love problem. We need to love him. We need to press into him. And when you read stories like this, man, you realize he's not hard to love. In fact, he's hard to not love. Jairus is like, no, I'm going public. I, I don't even care. I'm just, I'm seeing Jesus. He fell at his feet, realizing that's the sign of total surrender, abject humility before the one that you bow in that culture. There goes his reputation. He doesn't care. And he implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. In other words, she's dying right now. <laughs> like, this is urgent. I'm in a hurry. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live because I, Jairus, have finally run up against a problem that my money can't fix and my status can't fix and my education, yeah, it's of no value. All of my connections, all of my friends, like nobody can help me with this one. This is it, but that I believe that you, Jesus, can fix because Jesus is God. So like the rest of the crowd, Jairus approaches Jesus with a need, but he doesn't come insisting, he doesn't come demanding, he doesn't come standing, he doesn't come pressing, he doesn't come just to take. He's not coming to, to get Jesus to bow down to him. He literally bows down to Jesus with all that that implies. And he does this, I think, because through the illness of his daughter, he has been given a gift, and it's an ironic gift. I'm going to call it the gift of despair. It's ironic because nobody wants it. Nobody wants to say, hey, your, your daughter is dying. You want that gift? Nope. I don't. But what does a gift do? And why, therefore, then is it a gift? It crushes your pride. It reveals your powerlessness. It shows you the futility of trusting in this or in this or in this or in this or in this whole you know, collection of things that that we go through life sort of socializing our risks, you know, and, and minimizing and insulating ourselves against as many risks as we can. At some point, like, all those things fail. Like, there's something I can't control. And it's crushing. And what does it do? Because I don't come to Jesus in that moment going, hey, come on. I'm down on the floor. And in that sense, it's a gift. And it's a gift that comes in many different packages. You know, sometimes it is the threat of the loss of somebody that you love. Somebody, sometimes it's the actual loss of someone you love. Sometimes you've tried this and this and this and this and this and this to fill a hole in your soul that God has made you to be filled only by Jesus. And none of it works. And it's just despairing. Sometimes it's an impossible person or it's an impossible problem. It's an impossible assignment. This is over my head. Like, I can't do this. It's an impossible relationship. It's something that just brings you to the end of yourself and all of your resources are exhausted and there's nothing you can do. And it brings you to your knees before Jesus in humility. Okay, fine, I'll get help. Because Jesus uses help. Okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do this, this program. I'll, I'll go to this counselor. I'll, 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 it's crushing of pride. Pride is the thing that keeps us away from Christ and the work of Christ in our lives and in our issues. It just does. I can't tell you how many times over the years, and I, I've been at this for a while. I know that's surprising because I look so young, but I've been at, what? I've been at this for a while. So here's the deal. It was so funny. Years ago, this guy came up to me after a service, and like he walks right, I remember his name. He doesn't come to Rio. And he walks up to me and he, he kind of goes like this. And he goes, you look so much younger from down there. And, uh, and I thought, thanks, you, you looked smarter when you were down there. So I just, I think the same thing about you. I didn't say that. That was an inside thought. Held that inside. That's the fruit of the spirit, self-control. So many people I've met with are like, yeah, no, I'm not going to get any help with this. And part of the reason, you know, sometimes it's because I've given up. Jesus is going to raise the dead in this story, and I don't believe he can do that. So I'm done. That's one reason. But the other reason is pride. I hear people say, you know, I'm not going to get any help with this because, Tom, I'm a private person. I'm so sorry if maybe you're one of the people who have said that to me over the years. I honestly, like, I can't, names and faces are not coming to me. I would intend this for no one. But here's how I translate that. I'm not going to get any help with this because I'm a prideful person. Private and prideful are two sides of the same coin. 
You're just not desperate enough, I guess. There is a gift in despair if we'll embrace it. And that gift is that it crushes our pride and it brings us to the one who alone can help. And God sends Jairus, in this case, the gift of despair and the the impending death of his daughter. And he throws everything out the window. And he goes and he publicly bows at the feet of Jesus. And in response, what does Jesus do? He's surrendered to Christ, whatever he's going to do next, Lord. And Jesus, it says in verse 24, went with Jairus to his house. And then as he went, this great crowd full of standers and pressers and insisters and demanders, right, followed him and thronged about him. Hear that. And yet in that crowd, there was also a woman. So person number two who had a discharge of blood. What that means is she had a gynecological issue, and she had had it now, it tells us, for 12 years. And that might be a little more detail than you're looking for, but the details matter. It's important you realize what the issue is. She's hemorrhaging. She has a bleeding issue. And that's been going on for 12 years. That creates all kinds of issues for her, not just physical. I mean, yeah, she's anemic. She's pale. She's weak. She's physically just strung out. This has been devastating physically for her, but it goes way beyond that in this, in this society and in this culture that is governed over by the law of Moses. What this bleeding condition makes her is perpetually, meaning nonstop, okay, and contagiously unclean. So as a result of that, she can't go up, for example, into the temple of Jerusalem. She's perpetually and contagiously unclean. She can't go into the synagogue over which Jairus is one of the rulers. She's perpetually and even contagiously unclean. She can't be around people. Anybody she touches becomes unclean. Anything she touches becomes unclean. So if this happened to her before she got married, for example, then dashed were her hopes of marriage, dashed were her hopes of children, dashed were her hopes of all of these things that we grow up expecting are going to happen to us, but they don't always, do they? But we think they will, we hope they will. Those are all taken away. Or worse, maybe she was already married and she already had kids and now she watches them from a distance play in the park. And she's divorced because of this. Her family, she can't live with them. And apparently there's really like no earthly hope for her in the first century at least because she exhausts all of her money on doctors. Mark tells us, he says, and and she had suffered much under many physicians. Can you imagine the indignities that this poor woman went through under the primitive like medical practices of the first century? And she had spent all that she had. So now she's financially destitute as well. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. And yet Mark tells us that she had heard the reports about Jesus, another physician, a healer who had healed, by the way, and no doubt she heard this. I mean, the way the story plays out, she knew this story. He had healed a leper. What is that? It's a perpetual state and a contagious state of impurity. He'd healed somebody, different condition, but same end result as her. And how did Jesus heal the leper? Because, you know, you can't touch a leper. You can't be touched by a leper because they're unclean. What does Jesus do? He touches the leper. The contagion of his purity is greater than the contagion of impurity. That's the idea. And that goes out from him. And the man is healed and restored. And so she starts thinking, hey, man. What if somehow I can come into contact with him? This woman's faith is amazing. She hasn't given up. She's like, ah, no, I'm not going to try anything more because I've tried this and I've tried this and I've tried this and I've tried this. None of that has worked. Okay, get Jesus involved in it. Let's try that. Notice how she comes because she, she worms her way through the crowd and she's not insisting to me. She's hoping not to be seen. She's pulling her cloak around her face so that nobody knows who she is because she's spreading her contagion as she works her way through this crowd of people who live in the same town as her. And she comes up behind Jesus in the crowd and she touched, I, I think, one of the tassels that was sewn onto the hem at the bottom of his garment. So then where is she physically? She's, she's on the ground. She's down low is the point. She's bowing before the Lord. And here's her thinking. She said, you know, my faith is so great. She's thinking that I believe that I don't even have to touch him. He touched the leper. We don't even need to go there. Like if I touch something he's touching, we're good. If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And she's right. It says, and immediately the flow of her blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, 
That sounds crazy, right? Unless Jesus is God, in which case I'm going, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's nothing irrational about that. My mind is not having to get bent around that. I'm kind of looking for stuff like that. Wow, that's amazing. Look at what else God can do. Like, and you're saying, okay, so let's get past that for a second. Are you saying, Tom, that if I just bow at the feet of Jesus, he will then be obligated to do whatever I want for him? That's what the crowd's trying to get him to do, isn't it? No, he's not obligated because Jesus is God. But this crowd who comes insisting, this crowd who comes demanding, pressing all of this stuff, uh, he passes through their midst, okay? And they experience none of his power. Who experiences the power? Those who come surrendering. Those who come bowing. And sometimes the power that you will experience is, yes, the miraculous power of healing. And I think we need to develop some faith for that. I do. But sometimes the power that you will experience is the miraculous power of joy in the midst of your suffering. Of the presence of Jesus and of his power in your weakness. The presence of his wisdom in your foolishness. In other words, it is the unique experience of walking together intimately with him because you have nothing else and no one else to cling to. And you walk for a while in that. And you realize that you wouldn't trade his presence to get rid of the suffering that holds you there. He is amazing. That's why I don't think there are private Christians. That's why I don't think there are prayerless Christians. I think that there are Christians who don't pray much because they don't understand that prayer is just the vehicle into his presence. And they don't value his presence yet enough, but they don't experience because they don't pray. I don't think there are mission-free, like I'm not in mission at all Christians. I think there are Christians who are not on mission, but who need to wake up to the reality that Jesus is on mission. He sends us out on mission, and he says, and lo, I will be with you. In that, even to the ends of the earth, the problem is that we don't treasure him enough. When we treasure him enough, all these other things happen spontaneously and joyfully. It's amazing. So anyway, this woman who's just infected, you know, I don't know, half the crowd, don't even know what half at this point. She sneaks through, she's stolen her healing, and now she just wants to disappear for obvious reasons. But then we read in verse 30 that Jesus, I think the idea is he stops walking. They're on the way, they're on the fast track to Jairus' house. He's like, whoop, hang on a second. He stops and perceiving in himself, this is why that power had gone out from him. She touched him in faith and the power came. And immediately he turns around in the crowd and he says, who touched my garments? And then the disciples said to him, what are you talking about? You see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Does Jesus know who touched him? Look at the stories about Jesus. He reads people's minds. I mean, it's unsafe to think around Jesus. So just try not thinking. (laughs) That's what I try to do before I go to sleep. Like, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think. Maybe, am I asleep yet? No, darn. It's torture, man. It's not fun. Jesus says to his disciples, I need a donkey, so here's the deal. I want you to go into the city, and I need to take a left and a right and a boom, and then there's going to be a donkey. And by the way, when you're untying it, the guy who owns it's going to come out and go, hey, man, you got stealing my donkey. Like, what are you doing? And then this is what you're going to say to him. And then he's going to go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Take the donkey then, and then you're going to bring. He knows everything. Again and again, he's foreseeing everything that happens. He says to his disciples, we're going to go into Jerusalem. That's when I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be beaten, and I'm going to be scourged, and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised from the dead on the third day. Look, Jesus is God. He knows who's in the crowd that's touched him. But he's calling her out. Will you come forward publicly so that I can complete your healing? What does that mean? It means that if this woman is going to reenter society, not only does she need to be healed from the affliction that has caused her to be perpetually and and contagiously unclean, but she needs to be declared clean. And then she can go hug her kids. 
Then she can go back to her house. Then she can go to the temple. Then she can go to the synagogue. Jesus stops. He's like, all right, so who touched me? And the disciples are like, seriously, man? We're, we're going to do this right now? Come on. He's looking around. Probably looks at her a couple times like, it's beautiful. And it creates this kind of moment of, am I going to do this for her? And it's pretty perilous. I mean, if you think about it, she's just infected half the people in her hometown. It's a little place with her impurity. And they don't even know what half. So now they're all going to have to go through all of the ritual of being made clean. So they're pretty not jacked about that, I would think. And Jairus, one of the rulers of her synagogue, oh, by the way, his daughter's dying. And now you've delayed the master. That's probably not going to go well, thinking he's not excited about this delay. And what about Jesus? I mean, is he going to be angry with her for venturing his purity by reaching out as an unclean person and touching his garment? By stealing a healing that he never intended, at least consciously, to give, he could reverse it. She suffered for 12 years. Boy, would it be easy to be quiet. But the Christian faith is not a private thing. It says in verse 33, but the woman, knowing what happened to her, so she's healed, she knows it, and she could back out of this and just sneak away <laughs> in fear and trembling, and you can understand that. Great insecurity fell down before Jesus, and I love this, and she told him the whole truth. Did he know the truth? Of course he did. Does he know the truth about me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does he know the truth about you? Probably better than you and I know it about ourselves, does he not? Like he, he's personally witnessed it all. He knows our thoughts. Oh, good grief. Fear and trembling. Unless you read stories like this and you realize he's calling me forward to tell him the whole truth and I have nothing to fear. There need be no trembling because of what he's like, because of who he is. And when you're taken by what he's like and who he is, you tell people about it. You're like, oh, Lord, I just want to spend time with you. I'm going to make some time to pray. I'm going to learn how. Because you're the, you're the end game. You're the, I'm going to go out on mission because that's where I find you. Like, she tells him the whole deal. And notice what he says to her. He declares her clean. Jesus said to her, listen to the language, daughter, could you find a more personal, intimate word than that? It's family, child, daughter, your faith has made you well. It wasn't the grasp of her hand, but the grasp of her faith. It wasn't her contact between her body and something that was contacting his body. It was the contact of her heart with his. That's it. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. You're like, that's ridiculous. Unless Jesus is God. Then it makes a lot of sense, and it reveals to you the heart of God. He's not someone you have to fear as you come and you tell him the whole story that he already knows. He's somebody who's made provision to cover over the whole story, past, present, and even future for you. He's inviting and welcoming you in. Anyway, the story's not over because poor Jairus is standing there going, come on, let's go. And notice this, while Jesus was still speaking to the woman, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Jairus, you've, you've made a fool of yourself. You've embarrassed yourself. And we're going to take a vote to decide whether you can remain in our uh, really religious society you know, later today. And, uh, you know, just stop, dude. Death is the end. It's dead. It's over. There is no one who can help at this point. There's your impossible task. There's your impossible person. There's your impossible relationship. And Jesus asks Jairus to believe for more. He said, but overhearing, we, we, we read, what they had said to Jairus, Jesus said... To Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. You just watch this woman. Twelve years, touched the tassel, that's it, she's clean. Do you have faith for more? 
And Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Why? Because the girl is dead. And these, all, these people all knew the face of death. This is first century. People died all the time. They would die from ear infections for crying out loud. Silly little things in our day that we treat easily took them out. They knew what death looked like, and it looked like this girl. So they're weeping, and they're wailing loudly. And when he entered into the house, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him because they knew that he was dead, and that sounds ridiculous. And it would be ridiculous if I walked in and said it. I have no power to bring anybody back from the dead. Neither do you. That's not who we're dealing with. Jesus is God. So to him, death is like sleep. Even the most final thing for us is a little thing for him. And so he walks over to her like you would anybody who was sleeping. It says he put them all outside. He took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and he went into where the child was and taking her by the hand. He said to her, Talitha kumi, which means Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with joy. And it's not ridiculous. Because Jesus is God. And these guys who give us these stories wrote these stories in their blood. So then how should we approach God? What should be the posture of our heart? Because it's not the posture of the crowd. They, they come entitled. <laughs> they come standing. They come hoping to take and leave. They come hoping to get, not give. There's no surrender in the crowd at all. It's not those guys, but instead it's Jairus. It's the woman who come face down, surrendering to everything, surrendering everything to Jesus and placing themselves in their situation to, at his disposal. Lord, what will you do with this? and believing that he can heal, and believing that he can raise the dead. There's no pride there. There's just humility. What a gift a crisis can be, if that's the fruit of it. So I close with this uh, today. Have you surrendered to Jesus? You know, and have you figured out, by the way, like not only can you not control the impossible situations, those are obvious, but really anything. Now, we can plan and we can anticipate, and we, we, but we don't even know that we get tomorrow. So we're like, it's, it's outside of our control. Have you realized that private equals prideful? Love you, we'll hug it out later, really. But, but it does. And I say that because it never ends well for the prideful person or for anybody attached to them. Pride doesn't produce the fruit of life. Joy, peace. He's calling you to humility. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Because he is your only hope, period, in anything in life. Or are you still waiting for him to surrender to you? Because it seems like those are the options, right? I'm surrendered or I'm kind of sort of hoping he'll surrender to me. At least with regard to this. Like, I'll surrender in this, but not that. I get, you know, it's like it's an all in. Jesus, you are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. You are so purposeful. You are so glorious. You are so satisfying. You are so kind and gentle and powerful and wise. Gladly will I give you me all my mess and everything else. That's the invitation. Mark is an evangelist. And what he wants is your heart. And he wants it so bad that he wrote you his note in blood. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is life. We thank you for these men and women who, who lived and who suffered and who died and who continue even in this day to live and to suffer and die, to take the stories of Jesus and the story of his life, the person of Christ, and to publish it to folks like us. It's like, I'm not going to be there in 2,000 years, so I'm going to write this in my blood. So 2,000 years later, when you read it, you know that I meant it. I saw something. I experienced something. Oh, you want to know what the something is? It's all of this. It's who this, this Jesus is. 
Lord, reorient our hearts around your heart. Help us to realize that this is who you are, not the things that we've imagined about you, not the person we've made you to be in our heart. But know that you are gentle and kind, that it is your kindness that calls us to repentance. Reveal to us our inadequacies, not to shame us, but to heal us, to restore us, to repurpose us, to walk with us, to fill us. Lord, we confess we are not in control, and we are confess that we are grateful that you are. So inhabit us with your beauty that we can't be quiet about you, that we can't be prayerless and, and live effectively without you. Lord, draw us in today and heal what needs to be healed. Fill what needs to be filled. And do this for you that you might be exalted. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.